The Minister of the Economy and Trade, I'm gonna make some opening remarks. Rayad Khoury uh, will speak to us first, so His Excellency, Rayad Khoury. Good morning. It's morning, Sunday, Las Vegas. <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to be part of today's event, the Lebanese Diaspora Energy Connect to Achieve. It's indeed a compelling and exciting gathering that brings together an impressive number of Lebanese of North America under one roof in such a vibrant context and simulating city as Las Vegas. <clears throat> I'm sure that the energy of all of us coming from Lebanon, the energy of you, the diaspora, added to the energy of this city will result in sparkling meetings that will come up with glowing outcomes. Let's take advantage of this unique occasion to join our energies and transform them into opportunities that would benefit our beloved homeland, Lebanon, and the countries of your residence. Dear participants, the world has never been as connected, leading to unprecedented opportunities for economic growth and prosperity. The advent of the digital economy has taken market access to new levels, that paving, thus paving the way to new possibilities, ones that, if harvested adequately, can bring wealth and stability to even the most remote regions of the world. For instance, supply chains can now stretch efficiently and at competitive cost from distant villages to the shelves of merchant stores around the planet. This induces the integration of the Lebanese products into the value chain of the multinational corporation in which many of you, diaspora, are part of. I encourage each one of you to develop appropriate linkages in which even sector you consider is feasible, which Lebanese creative and qualified producers and service providers. It is a recurring and rightful theme to talk about the Lebanese entrepreneurial spirit and the ability of my fellow citizens to establish and maintain economic ties in and between various geographic regions and their homeland. When it comes to the digital economy, Lebanon has not failed to continue its tradition of embracing novelty. The past few years have seen a surge of entrepreneurial activity in the information and telecommunications space with the proliferation of support services and programs which were echoed by a sharp rise of the number of startups in the field and emergence of a true entrepreneurship and SME friendly ecosystem. In fact, the last three years alone have seen the founding of more than 10 venture capital funds and close to 80 investment deals have been concluded between 2015 and 2017. Today, more than 410 million US dollars are available through such funds to support startup founding and SME growth. And tens of incubators, training centers, and support facilities have emerged to accompany that process. Accordingly, the central bank's circular 331 has certainly had a key role to play in bringing about that fertile business environment. I'm sure Dr. Anderi will talk about it. While some gaps remain to be filled in the spectrum of available funding options, particularly at the early stage and mature growth phase, equity and debt products are much more diversified than what they were only a decade ago. 
Yet what remains missing and strongly needed is foreign market access and a mutually fruitful exchange that can come about by having foreign-based investors and organizations tap into the rich human capital in Lebanon while offering in return channels to market and joint developments and delivery of products and services. It's indeed Lebanon's human capital that remains one of the country's largest and strongest specific advantages. The Lebanese education system is widely recognized for its high quality, which places it above the world average, particularly in math, science, and marketing. The availability of high reputation schools and universities has allowed Lebanese youth to fare very well in jobs and entrepreneurial endeavors around the globe. Therefore, connecting our successful diaspora to the solid human capital in the homeland, as well as leveraging the digital revolution to set up distribu distributed chains of product manufacturing and service delivery can bring prosperity, prosperity to the Lebanese at home and abroad. In addition, the host countries of Lebanese immigrants. This recommendation goes in line with the conclusions reached by prominent Lebanese and regional experts in discussion panels that took place in the Lebanese SME Forum, which was organized in Beirut by the Ministry of Economy and Trade in July of this year. That event is one of many activities that the Ministry of Economy and Trade has on its roadmap, where the prime goal is to grow the national economy. In fact, the government of Lebanon and all its constituents, starting with the president and prime minister and including all ministries, have placed economic growth as a, as a top item on the agenda. This is to say that the rise of a strong entrepreneur, entrepreneurship ecosystem that Lebanon has experienced is paralleled by an equal commitment at the government level. We'll come to that later. Hence, you can rest assured that any initiative to build economic ties between Lebanon and its diaspora will receive the utmost, the utmost attention both by the public and the private sector. Now, and despite the difficult regional situation and the influx of massive numbers of refugees, Lebanon is on a solid path towards economic prosperity. Contrary to previous years, several elements have laid the foundations for rapid recovery and growth, including the political stability that has occurred following the election of President Aoun and the formation of the confidence-building government headed by Prime Minister Hariri, and the monetary stability resulting from the central bank successful leadership of a banking sector that continues to enjoy high levels of liquidity. Several other in ingredients also bear the promise of significant successes for us all, namely the foreseen oil and gas boom, the continued expansion of endeavors in the knowledge economy, the constantly evolving yet ever stable and resilient financial sector, and last but not least, the foreseen reconstruction of the neighboring Syria. Which will further reinforce Lebanon's traditional role as a geographic platform connecting various markets and a key hub for regional economic activities. Most importantly, coming back to government commitment, is that for the first time ever, we as a government are in the process of laying down a medium and a long-term macro and sectorial economic plan that will be adopted by the president, the council of ministers, and eventually the parliament. Since the first day I took my responsibility as a minister of economy and trade, I thrived and I, I had an ambition, a goal, that the Lebanese government must have a clear stated economic plan that promotes sustainable growth and development. 
I knew as well from the first day that alone I will not be able to achieve this plan and turn it into reality. I knew that major politicians and head of parliamentary blocks need to buy in this plan and believe in it. I worked very hard to convince them and His Excellency Mr. Vasil stood next to me and he pushed along the same direction. Nowadays, a ministerial committee has been formed to put in place this economic plan with the assistance of one of the major international consultancy firms. This committee will be meeting nearly every week in order to put in place a mechanism to pursue and implement this plan. This plan will, in brief, eventually achieve the following three goals. First, create an economic identity of Lebanon that will be adopted by the entire public sector, the private sector, the civil society, and the media. Two, identify the major economic sectors that the government deems appropriate to enhance based on competitive advantages of these sectors, aiming to attract investments, local and foreign, and increasing export productions. This will increase GDP growth and create jobs. The government will, conse will consequently enhance these sectors by creating incentives like the low interest rate, taxes, free land, etc., and protection as well. Number three, initiate a couple of pilot projects that can be achieved in fairly short period of time, which will, will boost definitely the confidence and create the right momentum to kick off the economic cycle. And ex as an example, like free economic zones in different places in Lebanon, especially the boundaries with Syria. We are optimistic about the future of Lebanon, a country that now offers a unique and compelling set of opportunities, which I urge you I got mixed up with my papers, which are, I urge you all to consider, especially in light of the country's blossoming startup and SME support ecosystem, its rich talent pool, its international network of diaspora and friends, its stable political and monetary situation, and commitment of the government of Lebanon, of Lebanon towards economic growth and prosperity. And thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to say thank you. You made it out here. It's not easy to wake up early in the morning in Las Vegas, so I really appreciate that. Um, and second, I hope you had a great time last night at the gala. Um, to, uh, to my panelists, I'm sorry the chairs are not as comfortable or as great as the ones we had, but we're going to have a very interesting discussion today, and that's not going to uh, impact uh, the importance of this panel. Um, before we start with talking about banking and uh, the financial uh, products and the relationship uh, of Lebanon, Canada, and the U.S. in the banking sector, uh, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about myself because you're probably looking at me and saying, who is this Jamal Najim? What is she doing on the stage and why should we even listen to her? Um, honestly, I'm asking myself the same question, but nonetheless, I am going to tell you a little bit about me, why I'm here, and, um, and then we'll get going into the important stuff. So my name is Jamal Najim. I am a very proud Lebanese. I live uh, in Ottawa, Canada. I am married, yes, of course. It's a beautiful country and a beautiful city in the summer. Um, in the winter, you'll want to think about it. Um, I am married, I have uh, 
a 19-year-old son who was with me yesterday but had to leave today, and a daughter, she's 16. I am from, uh, my father is from Batroun, Shubtsin, Montet al Batroun, and my mother is from Jbeil, and uh, I uh, married a husband, of course, who is from Zahli. And uh, I learned about love, and I learned uh, what it means to be closer to God when I met my wonderful husband from Zahli. So Zahli is very special to me. Um, thank you. Now, I'm here because there are a few ladies in my life who I consider very close friends, and without them, I wouldn't know anything about this diaspora. I would not have heard about it. I'm busy doing my life, uh, working with, you know, folks from Canada, and feeling Lebanese, knowing I'm Lebanese, but not really connected to the Lebanese community. Uh, and I want to say a big thank you to those ladies, and if you don't mind, I'd like to thank them personally. So the first one is my best friend, Lilian Hello. If you haven't met her, then you really should. <laughs> She's an amazing woman. Uh, Carol Sfer, who's, uh, who really uh, was moral support for me in some of the most difficult times of my life. And uh, Mireille Tebet, I don't know where she is, but uh, she's the one who keeps me smiling and, and laughing. Uh, and of course, uh, Haifa Sherbel, who uh, really pushed me on the stage and uh, opened the door for me to be here with you. So if you like what I have to say, you can thank them. And if you don't, well, you know who to blame. So um, let's talk a little bit about what I do. I'm not in the banking uh, business per se. Um, I do like money, I like making money, and I enjoy even more spending it. Um, but I am in technology. I'm a digital transformation uh, expert. Uh, I'm well renowned in my space, in my industry, uh, sought after to do large digital transformations, primarily in the telecom sector. I do have my own consulting company, but I myself, I am an independent consultant, um, paid very well to disrupt uh, technologies and companies and uh, make sure that it happens very quickly. So I'm like a tornado, if you will, when you bring me into your organization. Um, one of the projects I'm working on right now is a transformation that's about to uh, end. It's a, it was a three-year transformation I did for a company called Kojiko. Prior to that, I worked for a company called Bell Canada. I did transformations at a company called TELUS, uh, Rogers, and T-Mobile. If uh, you're the guys from the US, you may have heard of T-Mobile. I worked for companies like Ericsson, Accenture, MDocs, Netcracker, and in all those companies, I held vice president or very senior leadership positions. Uh, all this to say that my whole career has been doing what I love to do. And it is exactly that, transformations. It's, it's promoting change. It's uh, pushing for um, progress and using technology to improve uh, the, the lives of, of people like us uh, every day, make it easier. I dream of a paperless world uh, where, and I'm also very lazy, I don't like going anywhere uh, to fill out forms and to uh, get what I need done. I like to just pick up my phone, press a button, and something magic happens behind the scenes and my life is all good and I can go on doing what I need to do. So that's uh, what I do. Uh, now, some people think I'm successful, but they have their own reasons of how they measure success. I am successful by my own account in the sense that for me success is happiness and I'm a very happy woman, I love life. And success is also about having the ability to choose and having some control over your destiny. And it took me a long way uh, to get to a point in my life where I can stand or sit in front of you today and say, you know what? I made it, I can choose. I can choose what I want to do, who I want to do it with. I can choose uh, where I want to be, where I want to live. I can, yeah, I can choose. But why this is important for me is because when I came to Canada, I was six years old, and I was raised in a very male-dominated family. 
Uh, I didn't have a mother. Um, I didn't meet my mother till I was 25, but that's another story for another show. Um, so I was raised by my father and my eight uncles. And it was in a, in a culture, traditional, old school Lebanese culture, where as a woman or as a girl, you do as you're told. And I was told a lot what to wear, who to date, whether or not I can take a certain job, uh, when to be home, uh, what I should act like, talk like, walk like, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, and always told to worry about what people think and what are they going to say. And I played along with that until I was in my 20s and then I said, it's enough. I'm a woman. I have a head on my shoulders. I'm going to make it on my terms. And that's when I um, asked my father, actually I begged him to let me work because I wasn't, you know, in, our, in my family it was like, we don't have girls who go work and go live by themselves if they're not married. So I, asked, I said, I really want to work. And as soon as he agreed, after a lot of convincing, I found my key. And work became my, my escape, if you will, my, my key to freedom, my key to independence. And I promised myself I will never become a kept woman I will always be a woman who, uh, you know, draws her own destiny. And I worked very hard. I came from a family where, you know, I would wear secondhand clothes. I'm not ashamed to say. We would get my clothes from the basement of a church, single dad, four kids. You know, it's not a rich man. We lived in a neighborhood in Ottawa that the police wouldn't even come to. My neighbor's drug dealers, I'm sorry to say. But today... I'm a real estate investor with million dollars of real estate investment. I earn more than most men do uh, and most women. I'm very proud of that. But I'm mostly proud of the fact that nobody can tell me what I can do, where I can go, what I can say. I'm my own woman, my own person. And I am Lebanese, and I made it. And I'm so proud to be here with you today. So enough about me, because there are a lot of important people sitting on this panel that have very important things to say. Um, I have some questions for our panelists that I will be asking. Uh, we are not going to be standing here. This is going to be like a big living room, we're all friends, we're all family, and it's going to be hopefully an engaging uh, panel. I will be asking the panelists questions that I find are important. In the meantime, I would encourage you to think about any questions you may have, and once we go through our own set of questions, because I'm important, I will ask my questions first. Um, then I will encourage you to come up and ask your questions as well. And if we like your questions, we will answer them. I'm just kidding, we will answer all the questions. Oh my God, you guys are all asleep. Okay, so um, the first, uh, is uh, first question will be to Dr. Saad Andari. He's, uh, I'll, uh, just in case you didn't catch it the first time, Mr. or Dr. Endari is vice governor of the Banque du Liban. He's also a member of several uh, bank committees. And so if there's anything to know about banking, uh, Dr. Said Endari is definitely the right guy to uh, tell us about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so maybe I will start with the question uh, for you. Um, uh, Dr. Endari, um, but before I do, if you want to maybe just uh, take five minutes and uh, share with the panel uh, a little bit about what you do and its relevance to, uh, to, this, uh, to this panel. Yeah, it works. Uh, thank you, Jamal. After the, this interesting introduction, uh, I think we are going to go into the more uh, boring uh, financial stuff. Uh, so you have to bear with me for the coming two, three minutes. Money is never boring, uh, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
I have to connect with what His Excellency uh, Minister uh, Raed Khouri just uh, talked about the macroeconomic plan, uh, which uh, Lebanon is going to un unveil. Uh, so uh, he, he talked about the, uh, the development of the real sector. And the real sector needs, uh, as complementary uh, to it, the financial sector. The financial sector in Lebanon, and I want to allay the fears of many of the Lebanese in diaspora that I have met uh, here a couple of uh, past uh, couple of days. Um, Lebanon is one of the best regulated banking systems anywhere in the world. It is definitely the best in the MENA region. And uh, let me tell you why. Uh, we have worked over the past few years to instill financial integrity and responsible banking. And we have implemented effectively five basic principles. The first principle is empowering people. Uh, Lebanese banks are owned by, by families and uh, families that have been running banks for the past 20 years, 120 years, and very successfully at that. Uh, we have, uh, to complement this family structure, we have uh, required of all banks to have independent board members. Uh, we have also required all our staff, banking staff, to be trained pursuant to professional and technical directives. We have risk, compliance, remuneration committees. We have an audit committee in each bank, presided by independent board member. Uh, the audit committee selects external auditors. And incidentally, we have two joint uh, auditors, not a single auditors. And we have... Um, also consumer protection requirements and oversight over the protection mechanism. The second principle is to ex exercise justice. And by that we mean that in the past, uh, if, you, if you go back 15 years uh, ago, we only had 30, 40,000 beneficiaries of bank loans. Now we have three quarters of a million of Lebanese who are beneficiary? Forty percent of the forty um, percent uh, of the population of the adult population are recipient and beneficiaries of bank loans, and this is partly thanks to our st stimulus and incentive program. Uh, the third principle is we advocate transparency. All our board members have to attend orientation programs in corporate governance. It's a must, even the chairman of banks. And I think we have a chairman here who has just disappeared. But he has to attend <laughs> these corporate governance programs. And they, they, they really spend two days with us to learn how to implement corporate governance, to attune to latest, latest developments. Uh, we have... Uh, been one of the first countries to implement IFRS 9, the International Finance Reporting Standards. And uh, incidentally, you have to implement it in 2018. Lebanese banks have already implemented it in 2016, two years uh, ahead of schedule. What the IFRS 9 means, it, it uh, effectively tells you that you have to have specific classification of your asset portfolio, and it means under this classification, if uh, you have not uh, provided, you have not uh, provided sufficiently uh, financially uh, for the uh, quality of your portfolio, you have to make the provisions ahead of, of time. And we have bankers here who will tell you that they have already fully provided for IFRS 9. And also, it tells you that you have to study your loan portfolio in detail. Every single loan 
that you have provided has to be assessed for impairment. And if we feel that it is impaired, you have also to put up provisions ahead of time. So everything we do is preemptive. And this effectively improves the quality of your uh, balance sheet. Uh, number four, we have uh, regulation that is a demand for all. All market players uh, tell you we need regulation. As a banker, I used to go to the central bank and tell them, basically, I, basically, I want uh, this uh, new uh, amendment to IFRS 9. I remember that back in 2007. I went to the central bank. So there, it, it, it is a proactive process. It is a two-way process. We meet regularly with the bank's association. Before we issue any regulation, we have to sit with the bank's association and discuss. This is by law. It's a requirement. You don't find any, any such stipulation in any uh, country around, uh, around us in the Middle East. And finally, our customers trust their banks. Why do they trust their banks? Because over the past 25 years, not a single Lebanese pound was lost by anybody of the uh, depositors in Lebanon. And that is thanks not only to the regulation, but also to a merger law that is still in place that allows you to effectively bring about healthy res resolutions uh, to banks uh, in, in trouble. Uh, finally, uh, we have also the BIS solvency and capital requirements, which we have to put them in place by 2018 already by 2016, all banks are compliant with BIS Basel III, and we are now ahead. We are now already moving into Basel IV. Uh, we have also a financial intelligence unit that you, you may have heard of, which allows us to be compliant, fully compliant with the uh, international regulations. So basically, this is the Lebanese banking system. This is wonderful. Okay, you can get your checkbooks out now. Sure. If you don't feel safe about that and secure to invest in Lebanon after this speech, I don't know what's going to convince you. But let's, uh, let's I'm, I'm just going to go to the end, just because I'm Jamal and I never go by order. Um, so, Mr. Andy Khaweja, I'm so thrilled that you're on this panel. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm just interested after uh, you what you just heard, um, you're, uh, you are the CEO of a very successful multi-billion dollar company, Allied Wallet. Um, what, do you, what do you feel about investing in Lebanon? And what do we need to do to convince you? Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Um, I want to thank, uh, where is his, uh, our counselor, <laughs> Johnny, for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. Um, I, I do have to dis disagree with few uh, subjects that came up. I didn't write any notes because, you know, uh, this is what I do on a daily basis. But let me give a small introduction about what I've accomplished so we can be on the same page. Uh, 13 years ago, I started a company called Allied Wallet. And uh, the whole infrastructure of the company was to eliminate fraud online. When the credit card business Begun, there were many transactions that were taking place e-commerce, which is called num present, num point of sale. I had the privilege to an architect a gateway system that can scrub these transactions, eliminate fraudulent transactions based on identification of the IP address, the bin issuer from which region it's coming. Does it really belong to this person? Has this person ever been conducting business online or none? Down the road, we have implemented uh, six, seven years ago uh, artificial intelligence system, which is AI. Uh, it's all self-controlled. It scrubs transaction on its own, and it, uh, it, it pretty much does things behind the imagination in terms of the technology and advance of it and cybersecurity and on and on and on and on. Uh, that had 
put me in a very good position to sell my services and uh, grow, which is today we serve 58 countries around the world. And uh, we have about 155 million B2B merchants. And we average about 200 plus million transactions per day. Wow. The beauty. <laughs> Just thank wow. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. The, uh, the, the, the beauty of the business is you get to travel a lot and you get to meet a lot of different uh, fintech companies and uh, central banks pretty much around the world. We're heavily involved in Japan, US, uh, UK, Germany, and Hong Kong, China, and on and on and on. And we have presence in many of these countries. The, uh, what, what made Allied Wealth what it is today, which is our evaluation last month by Merrill Lynch with $24 billion company, and I own it myself. Uh, we started from $13, to, you know, oh, about 13 and a half, 14 years ago. <laughs> but that, you know, there was a niche, there was a niche that we took advantage of, which is banks till today, they don't see it. And the niche is you have many entrepreneurs all around the world, including in Lebanon, which is I visited four times in the past uh, eight months. Banks don't give a chance or an opportunity to start up companies, just like myself. Just like myself. When we, when we started Allied Wallet, we pitched many banks about our business structure. We want to be a third-party merchant processor. We want to come into the market and handle a third-party portfolio. The biggest fear of the bank, bank business is the compliance and the risk. The biggest fear. And I do know many banks, and I know, you know some of the cases, non-compliance cases, that really hammers them, and they get fines, and they get a lot of issues. Because they follow one protocol. It's one line of protocol. They don't think outside the box as much. So we went ahead and start offering opportunities to start a business. Mostly college graduate. When you finish university and you drown yourself in debts and you're starting a business, you have zero financials, you walk into the bank, say, I get this idea. I'm starting a new application. I'm starting my website and my website's gonna be a close coordinator, which is I'm thinking of earning maybe $20,000 a month in business, just selling ideas. The bank is gonna look at you. All my life I've been doing refinance, commercial real estate, loans for cars, uh, loans for apartments or residential real estate. I have no idea, what are you talking about? And how's that gonna be done? Well, James gonna recommend David and David gonna ask Jose about the color coordinations and I'm gonna be making money on all these guys. That's not the kind of business we understand. We don't want to deal with it because the compliance and the risk immediately they decline it, not based on the risk, based on lack of knowledge. And that's the secret. And that's when we stepped in and we dominated 58 countries around the world, including, I'll name a few, in Japan, for example, in the past 13 years, Shomotomo, Digitex, JPayment, another lane, uh, Access Payment, which is publicly traded and, and the Tokyo Stock Exchange. All these companies began from zero. Three, four ideas came up. Today, they trade over two to three billion dollars each. Wirecard Germany, 14 billion today trading. And the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. Credirex, we're talking about Lebanon, it's a small country. I hear that a lot when I'm in Lebanon. But Lebanon, it's a very small country. We don't have the magnitude of consumers. Then I say, okay, look up Malta smaller than Lebanon. A company started by the name of Credirex. We helped them, we helped the infrastructure. Today, they're over 700 million in no time. You can dominate a market. You can enter the e-commerce. It's simple, it's easy, and it's reachable because behind, you're sitting behind a computer, you got the internet, you can reach our places behind your imagination. Now, we wanna talk about what's the lack. What's the lack of growth in Lebanon, which is I had it myself. It's an amazing infrastructure. It's an amazing, you know, uh, saving money and employment. Large corporations like Google, Apple, Amazon, and myself, we outsource India, we outsource uh, Eastern Europe, we outsource uh, Philippines, customer service, customer support, IT support, and on and on and on. And backup for uh, 
developers, medium, medium developers, young developers, and uh, some senior developers in certain region because of the cost. An average US developer, .NET, 150 to $350,000 a year. You want to build an infrastructure, you need to have 20, 30 developers. So you outsource many other regions. Lebanon, it's great because the pay is low. Many of these corporations interested. I myself was interested, so I went, I pitched it. I hired a few guys, gave them a program, build that for me. A program I can get done in Asia or in the US that takes about a week. In three months, I can get it done in Lebanon. Number one problem, electricity. They keep on complaining, we don't have electricity. Sorry, I can't, I can't code because the electricity is down. I have to wait for the electricity to come back up. Second problem, internet is very slow, extremely slow to upload files and to upload a uh, uh, few gigabytes. It, it's, it's terrible and I've seen it myself. It doesn't work. The third problem, stability. Stability is very important because that's what gives hope to Lebanon. I myself, I went and I met quite much with, uh, with all the leaders in Lebanon in the past few months. With Nabih Biri, with Saad al Hayri, with uh, Nader, and uh, the president as well. And I was honored to meet all of them. But the thing is, if there's no stability, there's no hope. And if there's no hope, there's no investment. I mention it and I say it again today. I'm willing to invest up to $5 billion, that's in B, in the infrastructure of Lebanon technology. <laughs> <clears throat> Why would I take the risk? If I invest that money and that infrastructure in Asia, there's no risk. There's no war. There's no problem. I know my money will be doubled and tripled. If I invest that amount of money in Europe, I know it's safe, it's secure, because we're not gonna, we're not gonna have a war. And that's something that concerns me constantly about Lebanon. If we have peace, if we have stability, I'm not the only Lebanese that will write a check. I know many that many of you, you don't even know. They've been forgotten. I met them in Hong Kong. I met them in Japan and a few even in Macau. Then they've never been to Lebanon. But they're very filthy rich and they're willing to do something for Lebanon. But the first, the first thing they say, what, what if Israel one day will come and destroy my infrastructure? Look what happened in 2006. They're worried and I don't blame them. Because I'm on the same page, I would be worried too. There's many things need to be improved and I would love to be part of it. I wanna help, I wanna assist. I've given, <clears throat> I was honored by Dr. Joseph Jabra. I've given a commencement speech at the uh, Lebanese American University last summer. And you'd be surprised how many of the Lebanese youth has reached out to me by finding my email address through my company more than 1,700 emails I have received from young Lebanese begging for mentor. Can you mentor us? Can you show us how to do it? Can you help us? We need stability, we need peace. I was honored to have an interview with Marcel on TV in Lebanon. This showed them very well for him and I received more than 27,000 emails from people I never even knew, all Lebanese, asking for a mentor, asking for guidance, and asking for hope. Stability will make Lebanon the most powerful economy in the region. We can do it. It's no longer about the oil. And I learned one thing from Japan. In 13 years, I have spent close to seven years living in Tokyo. Zero resource. There's nothing beneath the ground. It's an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean but the brain got them to be the most powerful economy in the world, second largest. I don't think China with the manipulation of the books to the second. I think Japan's still the second. Zero resource and they have more resource and funding than Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates and Kuwait all combined. It could be done. The power, the power of the brain is more powerful than anything out there, more powerful than the resource, more powerful than, than, than what you can imagine. 
the people, the people, if we give them guidance, we give them hope, and we give them the right uh, direction into, we talk about my field, the FinTech, financial technology, which is pretty much, it's all the young youth, what they're into today. Everybody's hooked up to a phone. It's like uh, <laughs> becoming an addiction, but that's good for business. <laughs> It's good for business, you know, and uh, it can happen. It, it just breaks my heart. Every time when I go to Lebanon, it breaks my heart to see the large unemployment of my people, that they can be generating a massive, a massive amount of business and a, a huge income. I'm here to help, and I would love to be part of anything to develop a better Lebanon and a much better infrastructure for all the young people in Lebanon. And I want to talk, I want to bring up a subject about the, uh, the banking. I invested in Lebanon in the past six months. I invested about seven to eight million dollars buying, you know, uh, apartments. The real estate is really down. So I said, I want to buy. I bought for my family, I bought for my, uh, for my sister gifts, just to send money into Lebanon from the United States, which is your money, it's completely clean in the US, to send money into Lebanon, the money was held by domestic bank for over a week, asking the reason for the fund, why are you paying somebody in Lebanon? I mean, I mean, in our line of business, this is you out of business. I do 80,000 wires a day in my company. We don't even have one gets questioned. Zero. And the reason why, not because my name is Andy Kawaja or my company is Allied Wallet, because the way we build a relationship with foreign governments, the way that we have proven ourselves to operate with foreign government, we send money from Europe to Asia, it hits the SWIFT in the US, OFAC always check to make sure the consumer is clean, it's not an OFAC list, there's no, there's no terrorist match list to it, it's fine. But when you send money from the United States into Lebanon, I don't understand why the domestic bank in Lebanon would hold that fund. And that is the, the puzzle that I never get an answer for, which is bad. If you, if you, if, if you operate in the e-commerce arena, and you have to fund third-party merchants, just like myself, just like Amazon, just like PayPal and Alibaba, you're done. Okay. We guarantee 24-hour fund receive. We guarantee it. And all our partners bank agree to that, and they deliver the funds on time. Okay. I will, uh, Andy. I'll give the panel back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your, uh, you know, your uh, insight and your candid uh, uh, thoughts and your passion and for wanting to help. That's, uh, that's a big thank you. But I would like to uh, now uh, uh, talk to Mr. Mike Ahmar, who is the president of Ahmar Investment Inc. It's a real estate development company. And Mr. Ahmar is also vice chairman of the LAU Board of Trustees. So uh, we've just heard what uh, Mr. Khawaja is saying, and I'd like to ask you, uh, as chairman of Partners Bank of California, can you tell us about the banking concerns that the diaspora has relating to working with the Lebanese banks from that perspective? Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Mohammed Al Ahmar. Um, I'm the chairman of Partners Bank of California. We're a community bank in California. We're about 10 years old. Um, the biggest concern that we have as American Lebanese about investing in Lebanon is the compliance issue and the risk of um, um, being looked at by the government and um, where is the money ending up at. So I would like to explain that point of view as a banker. The United States have, have an OFAC list, which is the Office of Foreign um, Asset Control, which watches every transaction, as Andy mentioned, um, and that OFAC list is a publicly listed list on their website. So the U.S. government and the banking industry in the U.S. has no issue whatsoever about investing in Lebanon 
as long as that money is not being sent to individuals or companies on that OFAC list. Otherwise, we're totally safe and we're totally fine about investing in Lebanon. So the issue that the government can help us and, and, uh, and, and the minister mentioned something about um, um, entrepreneurship and startup capital in Lebanon and the missing of the foreign investors. If the government can educate foreign investors in, in the United States and other countries about the risk of investing in Lebanon and, and, and downplaying the risk and explaining that if people are not on the OFAC list, their investments are totally fine, then we have no issue. Um, that, that's really the main concern that we have as, as American uh, Lebanese about investing in Lebanon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Elias El-Ash'ar. Um, so, Dr. Dilyas Lashar is, a, is the Director of Research and Statistics Department uh, at the Association of uh, Banks in Lebanon. Uh, so, I will ask you the question, based on what we heard, uh, is the Lebanese banking sector a reliable um, um, a consultant and partner, and if yes, uh, why? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. So, uh, mainly I'm here to highlight two issues, two main issues, that the Lebanese banking sector is well positioned to serve Lebanese expatriates and to satisfy their needs of products uh, uh, and services, banking products and services, modern and traditional services. And why the Lebanese banking sector is a reliable partner, a reliable um, catalyst, uh, financier, and many other issues because we have a wide uh, network of uh, banks inside the country and we have a large presence, wide presence abroad. We have, uh, let's say, 18 banks operating in 32 countries. Uh, secondly, we deal with a large network of correspondent banks, around more than 200 correspondent banks worldwide, 15 in North America. And uh, uh, we have good relationship with correspondent banks, mainly with U.S. correspondent banks. Uh, thirdly, we are, uh, as a banking sector, we are well regulated and supervised, and we comply with all international regulations uh, in the areas of a AML, CFT, sanctions, and tax evasion. And as Lebanese banks, we do not conduct any operations with individuals and entities listed on the OFAC list of the U.S. Treasury. And uh, also, as uh, Lebanese banking sector, uh, the Lebanese banking sector is resilient, highly liquid, solvent, and profitable. It has managed over the three, last three decades to overcome large economic uh, shocks and crises, thanks to the wise uh, management banks management, conservative bank management, and to the strong cooperation and coordination with uh, the monetary and supervisory authorities in our country. Uh, the return on uh, assets is close to 1%, and return on equity is around 11%, in line with international achievements, regional and international achievements. We're highly liquid. Uh, we have a liquidity ratio of uh, liquid assets to deposits around 60 to 65 percent. And um, um, what else? And uh, the capital adequacy ratio, BIS uh, ratio, capital to assets is close to 17 percent. So this is, these are main reasons why we are uh, well positioned, well placed to serve expatriates and uh, Lebanese residents as well. Thank you very much. Um, you can clap for him, that's okay. I won't be upset. <laughs> okay, so I will uh, ask uh, uh, Dr. Andari, did you want to uh, reply to any of the uh, points that uh, Maybe, uh, Mr. Khawaja had said? I'll Mr. Khawaja talked about stability and there is no hope uh, I beg to differ. I think we are one of the, we are a safe haven in, in Lebanon. We are an oasis in the Middle East. 
uh, we are more secure uh, walking in Beirut. And can, I, I can ask uh, the, our friends here who have been to Lebanon uh, recently, don't you feel you're secure walking at night and day? More secure than you would be in London or Paris? Or in Germany and Spain? Please tell me. No? I, I, I'm, I, I'm afraid you haven't been to Lebanon recently. <laughs> you have to go and, and feel the, the security uh, and the uh, stability in the midst of the turmoil and the raging wars in the Middle East. We are living in an area which is infested with, with wars, Syria, Iraq, uh, Libya, you name it, uh, Yemen. So, I, I mean, the uh, stability has to be taken relatively. Even Turkey is, in, is not stable. Issue of compliance, I have to ask one of the chairmen here. We have Chairman Salim Sfair, we have Chairman Fadi Asli of uh, Lebanese banks. I, my, my suspicion delays relate to issues of uh, compliance or inefficiencies in applying conf compliance regulations. Do you have any other uh, explanation for that? I don't think there's any. I mean, it depends on the bank you, you've been working with. Or maybe it was his name. <laughs> or maybe the name, I don't know. I'm not going to throw banks under the bus, but uh, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, we're not talking about the uh, walking down the street, getting hit by a car, being shot or car bombs, uh, safety. We're talking about something way behind that. Talk about regulations on the banking institutions in Lebanon. I talk. I talked about. I'm, I, I don't want to be drawn into uh, an outright, uh, you know, debate about uh, issues of security and stability. I leave it to the ministers who are here. But I can assure you. I mean, as explained, uh, uh, the five principles applied. If you're if you're not convinced, we are well regulated. I'm afraid that I cannot do much. See, I promised you it will be a nice, interesting debate. <laughs> There you go. Nice. <laughs> we, you know, the, what we're looking at, you know, this is a very different subject, not to be discussed publicly, but, uh, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, sanctions in terms of uh, operating funds to Lebanon. And uh, the gentleman, I'm sure, if he owns a bank in Lebanon, he's fully aware of what I'm talking about and where the funds get distributed to and on and on and on. And we know who these sanctions coming from and who's behind the sanctions, who's lobbying for these sanctions. But uh, they, as a businessman, you know, I'm trying to help my country. And uh, and when I, when, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I talk about Lebanon and Washington, and I'm not gonna, you know, go in, into details how much time I spend in Washington, who I spend time with, but the Congress himself, he knows. Uh, I put more time in lobbying for Lebanon, that most of you don't know, than, than all your lobbyists combined together what they do in a lifetime. Uh, and the things, the, the things what bothers me the most is what they think of Lebanon and why these sanctions take in place, which is very incorrect, very incorrect. And that has to change, and there's pretty much one solution to the puzzle to be continued. Thank you. M yes. I'd like, I'd like to Absolutely, please respond. As, as, a, as, a, as a California yes. banker and as a chairman of a bank, there is no sanctions on Lebanon whatsoever. As long as you are wiring and transferring and doing business with people or companies that are not on the OFAC list, there's no issues whatsoever. I assure you, my friends. I'm aware. So while well, we're on the subject, Mr. Um, Ahmar, as uh, vice chairman of the LAU, can you tell us about the um, cooperation between LAU and the Central Bank of Lebanon regarding Circular 331? And maybe what is 331 for the yeah. audience who is not aware? Thank, thank you. Um, Lebanon is suffering from brain drain. All the young, um, educated people 
as soon as they finish the college, they are looking to uh, immigrate and start a business or start their career somewhere else other than Lebanon. And if you look around the world, the Lebanese di diaspora is probably one of the most successful diasporas around the world. Everywhere you go, you meet successful Lebanese. The question is why they're not doing it in Lebanon. So at LAU, we're trying with, the, with Dr. Jabra's leadership, we are starting a center for innovation and entrepreneurship called the Mahzoumi Center now. And we're in the process of helping young graduates to create an accelerator and incubator at LAU with the help of Circle 331, doing the financing and the help of Lebanese banks filling in the gap between the 75% loan guarantee from the central bank. And like Dr. Anderi said yesterday, it could be up to 100%. So the government is very much willing to help those startups succeed in Lebanon. And that, that has a huge potential for the change of the mentality of the young people about immigration and staying in Lebanon and becoming successful in Lebanon. Thank you very much. Thank you. So was that interesting or what? So now what we'll do is, um, if I, I don't know how much time we have, but I would like to open the floor for the audience uh, if you have some questions to our uh, distinguished panel. Uh, yeah, okay, good. Um, is there a microphone that we can, uh, two minutes? Okay, so we'll make it very quick. Is there a microphone that we can give the gentleman? I got one here. I think, uh, oh yes, thank you. So there's a gentleman standing over there, please. Remember, we'll answer if we like your question. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning. It's economic good morning this, this time. We thank you all, the panels, uh, for your information. I have to ask a common question, and which we feel it, every immigrant, every Lebanese in the diaspora feel it, about the stability of the, of the lira, the currency, Lebanese currency. Lebanon is in bad economical situation, as we know, all of us, and as what you are talking now. What is the deep secret to Dr. Anderi? What's the deep secret you are sustaining the Nira at this rate? And by which cost? And for how long? And how can you allow us as uh, immigrants as, as to deposit our money in Lebanon and we are not worried about it and something like that? We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. So this is for Dr. Andari. Lira, the Lira has been uh, stable for the past uh, quarter of a century uh, now, uh, and I can promise you it's going to continue to be uh, stable, mainly because we have a uh, democratic uh, political system. Uh, we have uh, stability. We have security in Lebanon. <laughs> And uh, because we have a banking system which is about four times the size of the national economy. So we're in, uh, in, in you know, I can confidently tell you that we, we, we can continue to maintain a stable Lebanese uh, lira for the foreseeable, foreseeable future, I hope. Thank you, Dr. Andari. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Please. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Jeffrey McCary. I was raised in Connecticut and born as well. Um, I come from Zgarta, the northern town of Lebanon. I'm 21 years old. Um, I have a background in international relations. Um, I'm a specialist and I have a company in interior woodwork. I also work in a family company of uh, commercial properties. I have two comments and a question. I would first like to commend you for your inspiring story. And I urge you to take further action on the empowerment of Lebanese women. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And my second comment is for the gentleman right next to you. I would like to give a salute to the Lebanese army for keeping us safe. Yeah. With their, uh, with their limited uh, capabilities and arms for keeping us safe in Lebanon and for defending us against all terrorist groups, especially ISIS, from coming into Lebanon and on the streets of Beirut. My question also, I would also like to commend the gentleman, Mr. Andy Khaweja on the far, uh, on the far left, right, 
for taking initiatives targeting the Lebanese youth and graduates on, further, on furthering their capabilities and investments in Lebanon and not uh, for uh, investing um, abroad. So thank you for that. But I have a question for you. Which sector of Lebanese, uh, of Lebanese infrastructure would you first start to invest in, invest your uh, billions in, if Lebanon was a stable country and if it achieved stability? So um, that's my question to you, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for the question the and the comments. Uh, definitely in the, uh, in the tech arena because I see a lot of the Lebanese youth are very intelligent and they see the future as such a, you know, such myself and uh, I would definitely would like to invest in, uh, in the technology. And uh, when we talked about the sanctions, Lebanon always get threatened with sanctions. Recent one is by Senator Mark Rubio, by the way, which has had a long talk with him in Florida about, about the bill just to put you guys in the loop if you follow, you know, the, uh, tell the news. Tell them no, just yeah. tell them no. Exactly. <laughs> All right, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you. Okay, so quickly about uh, the circular, but very quickly, because we're running out of time. I think, I think you, uh, you, you didn't ask question about the implementation of this uh, diaspora circul circular. Okay. Please, that uh, His Excellency yes. Minister uh, uh, Basil yesterday uh, announced, yes. uh, if I may, yes, if you allow me uh, quickly, we have two types of uh, loans under this circular. One is ear earmarked for purchase or building a new house in Lebanon. Uh, the total amount is 1.2 billion Lebanese pounds, 800,000 uh, dollars. Uh, interest plus commissions should not exceed 2%. And this is the lowest, the lowest rate, and this is the lowest rate uh, in our uh, incentive and stimulus uh, programs. And uh, the tenor is 30 years. 30 years. With the grace period of four years. Wow. wow. <laughs> and so, Come invest in a house in stable and secure Lebanon. Andy, did you hear that? Number two, the type two, okay. type two uh, loans. It is non-housing to finance any new project in Lebanon, except uh, property development. We don't want to, uh, you know, uh, cause any um, in, uh, instability within the uh, real estate market. Um, the uh, uh, loan amount is, can go up to $10 million, 15, it depends on the project proper uh, and the type of the project. The condition, to, you can, uh, it depends on the uh, ability of the bank to finance. Uh, one bank can finance one million, one bank can finance 10 million, it can go up uh, according to the capitalization of the bank. And there is also one technical point which I have to point out. It's, uh, it is the, the funding of the uh, interest rate comes out of the reserve requirements held with the central bank. So this is a limiting factor to the, the total amount. Uh, and uh, one condition uh, here is that the borrower has, uh, cannot have a partner in Lebanon. He has to come and invest directly uh, in Lebanon. And uh, repayment is made within 15 years with a grace period, depending on the type of the loan, ranging between six months and four years. Thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you. So we are going to wrap it up. But before we do, um, because I know I still have a lot of questions, and I'm sure some of the audience do, and we're not going to ask them now. How can we get more information on this and who do we reach out to if, if we need to learn more about it? When you can go, uh, you can uh, check our website, bdl.gov.lb, okay. and you can call me anytime. Okay, very good. And banks. Yeah, they have their okay. own websites. Thank you. So, 
Oh, we've got. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for your attention. I hope uh, this was uh, informative for you, and uh, I wish you uh, uh, a great day. And one more question. Go ahead. Do I have uh, the permission to take? No, I have no permission to take another question. It's Sorry. Regarding the Western media, the Western neocon controlled media has been bombarding Lebanon with negative publicity. And I think it's about time, by the way, my name is Apo Jabari and I'm the managing editor of USA Armenian Life magazine. It's about time that the Lebanese diaspora and the Lebanese government and the people counter the negative propaganda on Lebanon because the Western neocon controlled media pursues a specific agenda to destabilize Lebanon by amplifying a minor incident and making it a big deal out of it so that it could repel potential tourists and investors away from Lebanon. And the time has come yeah. to be countered. Thank you for that very important closing remark, and I think it is a closing remark. So I wish everybody a great day and enjoy the rest of the LDE. Thank you. Thanks to our panelists.